Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to, uh, to be with you for this sixth, I think, I think edition uh, of the Digital Finance Summit. And this year, it's focused uh, on the economic re recovery. We, we, have, we have all been affected by the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, unfortunately, it's not over yet. This crisis that we are going through is very difficult, but it has the effect of accelerating digitization in Belgium and in the entire world as well. We have certainly gained several years in terms of innovation, but also in terms of evolution in mentalities. Digitization is the main challenge for the coming years. We all know that. That's the reason it was a keystone in the European recovery plan. Entire part of the Belgian recovery plan is dedicated to digital. AI, cybersecurity, digital administration and simplification, I hope so, open data, e-health. The challenges around digitization are important. We have no other choice than succeed. And in that challenge, running fast is not enough. We must run faster than the others, but without losing our mind. That's a mindset that we must build. A mindset to build a strong digital society. And that's a mindset that I call smart nation. To be a smart nation is being focused on three pillars. First one is ambition. We have to be more ambitious. We have the talented people. We have the creativity. We must think that the world is our playing field, not only Wallonia, Flanders or Brussels but the world. In fact, in digitization, sky isn't the limit. Outer space is the limit. Our competitors are in Beijing, San Francisco, not in Antwerp in Mons. Ambition. Second pillar, convergence. We have to work together, like you do here with FinTech Belgium. We must align different strategies. We live here in Belgium, in a complex country. Europe is also complex. We must find a way to build stronger ecosystems between us. Convergence is really fundamental. Ambition, convergence, and the third pillar is inclusion. Inclusion is really fundamental. Digitization is for everybody, the people who know, but also the people who doesn't know. We have to be aware of the digital gap, and specifically in the fintech sector. We cannot accept a, digi a digital society which exists only for a part of the population. Those are the three pillars of a smart nation. Ambition, convergence, and inclusion. To implement this mindset, we need to take action now in five particular domains. In infrastructure, 5G, for example, the connectivity is really a keystone for the future. Infrastructure, in trust. The trust is the cement of a society. It means improving transparency, improving governance of the data, readability of the algorithms. Trust is really a keystone. We must invest in administration, building digital tools with efficiency to simplicate the life of the citizens, the life of the companies. And you all know that there is a huge challenge in that matter. 
and that real, that's really a major concern for me and all of my team. A fourth particular domain is, are the skills, the digital skills. We must build the competencies to need. However, people acquire, acquire those competencies. High education, college, universities, lifelong learning. To, to my point of view, I don't care how you acquired competencies, as long as you have it. Skills is really important for us all. And the fifth essential domain where we must invest is the economy. It means the uptake of digitization in the traditional economy, but also a leadership in the new digital economy. For some, it means reducing the digital, the digital gap in the way we do business. And for the others, it means building a strong leadership based on digital innovation. That's all about what is FinTech for Belgium, a strong, innovative ecosystem. And it is essential to converge through those five topics towards common objectives in Belgium, but also with our European partners. We must aim for excellence through our projects and support our talented people and companies. As you know, the European fintech sector is very dynamic, attracting three times more private capital this year on larger deals. Fintech builds great technologies through innovations such as blockchain, AI, cryptocurrency. The opportunities that bring those kinds of innovation are endless. And I think that you know it even better than me. And it's a really big challenge for governments to take its place in front of such innovation. Too often we are running after the train and the good balance between technical, legal, and political views is really complicated to build. However, it's essential for the entire society to embrace that challenge and to find a way of giving an adapted framework for the development of the new technology. A framework with a good balance between innovation and privacy between digitization and democracy. That's what defining a digital society is all about. As we speak about FinTech, we speak about a deep concern for each citizen. FinTech is deeply connected to our humanity. I'm not judging, but for many people, their wallet is part of their self. Personal data around FinTech are sensitive. Dedicated algorithms question ourselves about transparency, readability, equity. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrency are so many revolutions which cannot live for themselves. They must serve people. I am convic convinced that digitization, uh, that digitization question ourselves about the society we want to live in. In that matter, the GDPR was a huge step forward to build trust in innovation. Today, with the COVID-19 crisis in Belgium, people are more aware of the use of their data. They are more conscious of the impact of algorithm. That's a good thing. But in a time where too much information kills information, it's a duty for us to build transparency and readability for innovation. And that's a huge part of my job, building trust in innovation. A few hours ago, I was in front of the parliament asking to build more trust for more digitization. I presented my projects to reinforce the privacy law in Belgium. 
a project based on more transparency and readability, a better governance of the data, but also bigger responsibility for the actors. Because digitization needs trust. And building trust is essential also for leading companies. It's essential to unleash the economic potential of the actors on the field. Thanks to this trust, we can make our companies stronger at the Belgian level, and we can strengthen the competitiveness of our companies on an international scale as well. It allows to support research, innovation, and the development of emerging technologies. Some technologies are not understood by everyone. It has been seen, uh, it, has, it has been so since the birth of humanity. The only thing that made them accept acceptable is trust. Think about the fire. Or think about, for example, the blockchain, which through the, led the ledger it represents, can be very useful to guarantee the authenticity of the data, for example. It can lead to a new way to consider digital interaction. We must be aware of those innovations. This is why my administration is currently studying the impact of integrating blockchain in its processes. We have launched working groups dedicated to the blockchain in which we will be able to explore the different opportunities, but also where we could analyze the potential threats. Finally, Building a strong digital society is considering digitization not as an end for itself, but as a tool to improve everybody's life. Building a strong digital society is about exploiting the available opportunities without suffering the potential threats. Through digitization, we are able to improve life science, mobility, healthcare, energy, all of those sectors in which your solutions, your solutions can have a concrete impact to improve the world of tomorrow. Ambition, convergence, and inclusion. I will conclude by asking you one thing is to build a better place together. Let's build a smart nation. I want to thank you again for the invitation and I wish you all a good day. Thank you, thank you very, very much. We do, have a, we do have a gift for you. So we do have a gift to you. Get some good stuff from Brussels to take home. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all those insights. I don't know if you have the time to stay around. The, from the back, great, because our next speaker is going to talk about the schizophrenic part of European legislation. So that's going to be very, very interesting uh, <laughs> to tune into. So, um, uh, Maria uh, Stajlikovic, and I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly, Maria, uh, you are the chairwoman, and please start coming on stage, of our European umbrella organization, the, U the European Digital Finance Association. So, Thank you. welcome on, on stage and look forward to uh, that schizophrenia and how to overcome it. Uh, yes, I wanted to choose a somewhat waking up line of my short presentation. And uh, I wanted to thank my uh, predecessor, the State Secretary, for his presentation because I would say that we can sign many of uh, his uh, ideas and uh, policy priorities. Um, However, I wanted to get back a little bit uh, on, on the ground, on the earth, and uh, spend a short while about uh, the state in which the European fintech system, which, as the State Secretary mentioned, is uh, very vibrant, um, finds itself. I wanted to start the presentation with a, with a cliche that my Spanish colleague uh, told me yesterday, that, um, uh, which is a somewhat uh, um, a simplification, but uh, I think, to some extent, it uh, shows you the reality here. The US invents, China copies, and EU regulates. Regulation is, an, is not a very sexy topic. However, this is a, the thing that can uh, decide the life uh, of an uh, innovative company. And um, 
that's why I wanted to make a couple of points about uh, the state we are in, in uh, regulation in the EU. Why is schizophrenic uh, state we are? Because on the one hand, the regulation helps uh, harmonize uh, rules and procedures across all member stage, uh, states, which makes uh, the sing uh, single market a reality for my financial services and opens up, it opens up access to companies so that instead of having just their domestic market, they have a market of uh, all member states. But on the other hand, Regulation puts a very heavy uh, administrative uh, burden and uh, many costs uh, on, especially on small companies, they don't who don't have uh, in, enough uh, money to to investigate into all the laws uh, they have to comply with. At the EU level, especially with uh, with this Commission, but uh, those previous as well, uh, her, uh, regulation is also used as a policy tool, which is understandable. And uh, when you read the po um, policy documents recently, you can uh, see that uh, there are four points that the Commission wants to, or the EU institution wants to attain with uh, regulation. The question is whether it is reasonable to think that the regulation can be the only or the main tool to do so. So uh, we he hear a lot of talk about the um, technological sovereignty of the EU. And in this sense, there are lots of uh, regulatory pieces uh, aiming especially at uh, the, co the competitors of EU companies or those who have most customers even on the European grounds, which are the American tech companies. On the other hand, regulation, as I already mentioned, creates a single market fin financial services, so it, it is a helpful tool. Commission and European politicians and national politicians think that the regulation can open up uh, the potential that, uh, that is held in the data economy it is true to some extent because even though we can uh, speak about uh, all the failures behind PSD2, it did give access to third parties to, to access data. It protects consumers, but again, consumers need to be protected, but sometimes we think that if we have a very strict regulation, the consumer will be protected, but if they do not understand the, the processes uh, behind or the technology behind, regulation will only kill the innovative solutions. So to be more specific, in the, in the digital sector, the schizophrenia uh, is displayed, especially in the uh, lack of a coordination, and I'm sorry for the harsh words, between uh, two DGs, the one, one DG that is responsible for financial services and the other one who is this, uh, responsible for technology communication networks and content, uh, DG FISMA and DG Connect. The one, uh, DigiFISMA is trying to open up uh, the market to harmonize it, uh, especially through uh, uh, regulatory pieces uh, like MICA, which is the regulation for crypto assets, or the pilot regime, which would allow, which actually creates a sandbox for, uh, for DLT uh, solutions on the European level. On the other hand, we have the activities uh, of DigiConnect, uh, which try to f fulfill all the policy uh, uh, motivation uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. They try to protect the European uh, customer from everything wrong that, that is wrong in, in, uh, in connection to technology. They want to, or we think we have the, 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 the feeling that sometimes they, they want to, they, they think that they can only uh, create innovative and support innovative companies by doing harm to non-EU companies. But sometimes what is missed in the argument is that uh, the same regulation will apply to the EU, uh, to the EU uh, actors as well. And uh, here I mean specifically two things that we uh, very often come into um, touch with uh, in terms of regulation. This is the AI Act and uh, blockchain services infrastructure, which both are to, to a certain extent good in their motivation, but some might, might be, especially the AI Act, might be harmful to innovative companies in the EU. The reason for that is that uh, it seems that, uh, with, especially with the AI Act, the, the Commission tries to, uh, and the Member States tries to regulate what has already already is regulated in other uh, legislative pieces, especially the uh, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. So we are just putting another administrative uh, burden on on uh, European companies. And uh, the EPSI, which 
which is the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, is a very nice idea that started uh, almost four years ago, but the implementation thereof is not really uh, as, as we would hope for. And uh, these two, uh, this example of these two DGs that are striving for the same goals but are using different uh, um, regulatory instruments is uh, showing you uh, the schizophrenic state in which most of the, uh, of, in which the uh, fintech sector uh, finds itself. But I, I don't want to uh, stop on the negative note, so I think there, are, there is also a regulatory way out of it. First of all, the work on sandboxes, on regulatory sandboxes on the EU level should be coordinated because right now we can hear about the AI sandbox, there is uh, the idea to create a blockchain sandbox and another DLT uh, sandbox. Uh, following the regulation, so the, there, is, uh, there are activities to create several different sandboxes that are not based in the same regulatory um, procedure, which creates uh, dissonance among them. So I think the work, the, the, the magic word here is just coordinate the work. The other thing is uh, the use of experimental clauses, which is actually the thing that would allow member states to give uh, innovative companies the space to test and this is uh, the legal background the legal uh, ground on which companies can get exemptions from uh, regulation that is in place and uh, I think this uh, idea of experimentation clauses which was already addressed by the council for example should be harmonized across the EU and Last thing, before we introduce a new act, like for example the AI Act, we should think whether those goals that we want to attain with that, like the um, protection of customers, are not already hidden somewhere in the lines of other regulations or regulatory pieces, so that we do not create more administrative burden. So that's the treatment uh, as we see and as we discussed uh, in the European Digital Finance Association. So I'm leaving you with that and uh, I wish you an uh, um, interesting debate about regulation, which is, uh, not a, which is not, as I said, not a very sexy topic, but the one that we uh, is depend on. Thank you. Yeah, big thanks for that, uh, those great insights. And our next speaker is Tom van den Berge from uh, Fibelfin. And he will tell us a little bit more about, uh, especially help the bankers in the room to establish those ESG standards and how to incorporate them and calculate them and move them in your processes, right? So look forward to that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about also about regulation but about a different kind of regulation, about sustainable finance regulation, ESG regulation. As you probably know, ESG, sustainability, has become a key topic for the economy as a whole, for politics, for society at large, and also for financial institutions. Globally, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and in Europe, we have the European Green Deal, and the sustainable finance strategy of the European Commission. The impact of ESG and the integration of ESG in financial systems will keep increasing over time. Already we have uh, a tsunami of regulation on ESG, on reporting, on disclosure, uh, and that will only uh, increase. In, in the next few moments, I would like to highlight two types of impact of the ESG regulation on the financial sector. On the one hand, the impact on product offering, and on the other hand, the impact on reporting requirements. Regarding product offering, we see that the assets in sustainable funds have almost doubled in the last six months. Globally, almost four trillion uh, dollars are invested in sustainable products. In Europe, almost half of the fund flows, the net inflow in funds, uh, goes to sustainable products. And also in Belgium, we see a similar picture. The last year, the assets in sustainable funds have doubled uh, to 100 billion euros. And we see that most of the inflow 
the new money into investment products from retail and from institutional investors goes to these types of products. So we have a very strongly growing market, growing demand, and correspondingly a growing supply of these kinds of products. This, of course, leads to some potential problems, issues, and the most important is, of course, what do we mean with sustainable? There is no real clear definition. Uh, sustainability is, is rather complex. Uh, if you want to integrate sustainability in, in financial products, it quickly becomes uh, complex. You only have to look at the taxonomy regulation. We only have a small part of the taxonomy which is ready now, and already we have more than 600 pages of very technical uh, criteria. This complexity, uh, a legal framework that is not yet adequate, um, could lead to uh, issues like greenwashing, uh, leads to uh, confusion, misalignment, a lack of trust with the investors and inefficient markets. Uh, we have a few legislative uh, and, and also private initiatives that try to tackle uh, these problems. On the legislative part, uh, we have the taxonomy, EU taxonomy, which provides definitions about which economic activities can be considered sustainable or green. Uh, we have the sustainable uh, finance disclosure regulation, uh, a regulation that um, asks asset managers and, and fund managers to, to be transparent about the degree of sustainability of, of their products. And we have the MIFID regulation. Huh? The MIFID regulation, as you know, is a directive that uh, requires that portfolio managers and investment advisors create an investment profile uh, so as to ensure that a suitable product is offered to a client. Traditionally, advisors need to look at knowledge and experience, investment horizon, risk appetite, and things like that. Now, as of next year, an investment advisor will also need to ask for the sustainability preferences of the potential client. He has to ask, how green do you want your product to be? How much must be invested in taxonomy activities? What kind of impact, what thematic focus do you want to have with your investment? Do you want to invest in energy efficiency, in renewables, in agro, uh, in biofood, in sustainable agriculture, healthcare, things like that? Does the investor want to exclu exclude certain sectors? For instance, does he not want to invest in fossil fuel, in weapons, in tobacco companies? So all these questions have to be asked and this will lead to an uh, offering of suitable products. We, we will need tools to, to, to help facilitate this matching between the preferences of clients with the offering of products. Huh? I think FinTech solutions uh, could certainly help in, in doing that matching because preferences from clients can be very diverse and there is also a very diverse offer of sustainable products. So this matching is certainly an issue. The financial sector also has taken initiative to, to, to help with this matching and to help investors, retail and institutional investors, navigate this, this very large and diverse offer of uh, financial institutions. And that's why Fablefin in 2018 has, has taken the initiative to create a label, a qualitative label for sustainable financial products, just with the aim to mitigate confusion uh, with investors to avoid green uh, washing and also to, to, to create some kind of movement in the financial sector towards more sustainability. Hmm? Uh, and this label is, is, is a set of criteria four products on the level of sustainability, uh, and these criteria are, of course, independently supervised and verified. The label exists for two years, and we see in the numbers 
the need that there was in the market for such a quality standard, for such a label. So in less than two years, we have involved more than 85 financial institutions, uh, a lot from Belgium, but the, the, the great majority from other European uh, countries and, and, and beyond. Currently, about 600 products have received uh, this, this label, uh, and they represent about 500 billion euros. So that's 500 billion euros uh, managed in Europe um, that follow the sustainability criteria set by the Towards Sustainability label. Uh, these, these figures make it the, the most comprehensive label of this kind uh, in Europe. A second impact I want to highlight briefly is the impact on reporting. As said before, there is a lot of reporting in, in Europe. Eh? It is the same uh, on sustainable finance. Here eh, I try to group the, the different um, legislations in three groups, and there are many, many more. But we can, we can group them in, in three objectives. Eh? The European Commission wants to reorient capital towards more sustainable uh, companies and projects. Uh, to, to improve the financing solutions for these projects. It wants to increase transparency and disclosure of companies about their level of sustainability, about their positive and negative impact on society, the environment, and so on. And it, will also, it also wants to have a better uh, integration of sustainability risks, and, and particularly uh, climate risk. All these legislations, for the moment, mostly lead uh, to reporting requirements. And that's what I want to focus up on. The reporting requirements, and here you see a few uh, reporting requirements that are specific for the financial sector. We have the taxonomy disclosure, we have the non-financial uh, reporting directive, we have prudential disclosures, uh, uh, we have the, the stress test of the European Central Bank, uh, and we have the, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. So it's, it's a whole list of regulations to which financial institutions are subject. The, the issue, and there I, I can relate to the previous speaker, is that all these legislations are not really uh, consistent or coherent. Uh. They have similar data requirements, reporting requirements, not always the same. They have similar indicators, not always the same. The scope is different, and the timing, and the timing of implementation is also not really aligned. This poses many practical uh, problems for financial institutions. Uh, financial institutions need to report on, their, on the greenness of their balance sheet, on the risk sensitivity of their credit portfolio and their investment portfolio, and to be able to do that, they need data. They need ESG data, and that data needs to come from their clients, uh, which are, for the most case, companies and households. But the issue is, Companies at this moment do not report on that data. So we have, we have a mismatch uh, between the, the reporting requirements of financial institutions and the ESG data that is offered, uh, provided by companies. And we are talking about CO2 emissions of companies, energy performance of buildings, the amount of green investments. All this type of information uh, is needed uh, by financial institutions. And we have a few bottlenecks and the provision of data, the audit of data, the, 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 the storage of data. So here also I think uh, maybe uh, FinTech or RecTech solutions could provide uh, a solution to, to organize this data flow a little bit more efficiently. And I think the next speaker will, will go into that a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.
And indeed, this was the, <coughs> this was the perfect uh, introduction uh, to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, running Greenonomy. Uh, uh, Greenomy, sorry, Henri Van Omé, welcome uh, on stage. Um, and who's exact, his startup, I may call it, is exactly in the business of trying to collect and structure those data to help everybody in the financial industry to know what the companies are doing, right? So yeah. go ahead and show us how you do that. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks, Tom, for the introduction that could have done, couldn't have done better. Um, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to represent Greenomy and to talk how we see the digitalization of those sustainability disclosure requirements as being one of the key drivers to achieve the goal of the European Commission to transition toward a more uh, sustainable state. As you probably all know, the global demand for sustainable funding is exploding and has been exploding for the, last, for the past three years. And actually, the European Union is leading that movement. By 2018, they represented almost half of the global investment in sustainable activity. Uh, but not only that, they are also leading in the implementation of innovative uh, legislation to regulate the market. Unfortunately, the needs of sustainable investment to achieve the goal of the Europe European Commission to arrive at uh, an economy that is carbon neutral by 2050 is still far from being reached. Which is why the EU Commission started to devise a new regulation that would allow the market to re-specify what can be considered as sustainable, hence allowing financial institutions to highlight truly sustainable prospect and reallocate capital towards sustainable investment and hence accelerating the transition towards a green economy. And that regulation is called the EU Taxonomy for Sustainable Activity. And some may say that it's the biggest change in the financial world since the introduction of standardized accounting rules. And as standardized accounting rules wanted to specify and, reg and regulate how company and how institution would uh, disclose their financial figures, well, the taxonomy is exactly the same aim, but for non-financial figures. You can see the taxonomy as first a classification system of hundreds and potentially more of economic activities that have a potential to substantially contribute to at least one of the six environmental objectives defined by the legislation. But it's also a methodology. So based on the activity and choice of environmental objective, it will define specific criteria, specific threshold to be met in order to state that the ac economic activity is performed in a sustainable way. And that taxonomy will become the common language between non-financial institutions that will use it to determine the part of their revenue and the part of their, their investment that are truly sustainable, and, no and financial institutions that will evaluate the part of their lending activity, the part of their investment, that are directed towards truly sustainable activity. But what, stands, what makes the taxonomy stands apart from other uh, ESG regulation uh, worldwide is first the, fa the fact that it's the first legally binding uh, set of screening standard to apply, and secondly, the sheer scope of its application. So from January of next year, so in a month, roughly 11,000 corporates will be mandated to produce their first, although limited, taxonomy screening. But by 2026, that number will go up to as high as 50,000 companies, including any listed company and large private company. But maybe what is more striking about the taxonomy is its indirect potential impact. Millions of SMEs won't be mandated to perform the taxonomy screening. However, they will be strongly incentivized to do it in order to attract capital, to attract investment uh, and investment opportunity. And while the taxonomy is quite clear in its benefit, beneficial impact, so providing a transparent and comparable methodology to bring down greenwashing opportunity to a minimum level, it also entails its fair share of challenges. And the first set of challenges concerns the accuracy, accuracy of the disclosure. How can financial institutions be, be certain that the disclosure of the corporates are uh, of enough quality, basically? Because as for now, 
there is a lack of ESG expertise on the market to meet basically the tidal wave of uh, reports that are coming in the next few years. And on top of that, there is also the potential compliance cost that it implies for those corporate, because the taxonomy is not an, an easy legislation. It is quite complicated, and it will require potentially corporation to adapt their IT infrastructure, to adapt the way they capture data and the report on those data, and that may be quite costly. Which is why our vision, the one of the only way to truly uh, let's say, realize the potential of the taxonomy is to digitalize the sustainability reporting from end to end. The goal is that by digitalizing the methodology, the idea of the, the taxonomy, you can vulgarize it. So you can vulgarize the taxonomy and make it accessible to all players on the market, be them large, small, private, listed, financial or non-financial. By enlarging the scope of the taxonomy scoring and of company doing a taxonomy scoring, you also enlarge the potential for financial institution to highlight, to uncover truly sustainable opportunity on the market and reallocate capital. And hence, you further push the objective of the European Union and the taxonomy to accelerate the transition towards a green uh, economy. And the way to do it is to create an ecosystem that is able to first digitalize all those legislation, which, as Tom said, have a lot in common and yet some differences, to be sure that you are able to support the generation of data at the non-financial company level by digitalizing the taxonomy, by making it accessible for them, just simply stating what are the criteria that applies to them, not having them go through thousands of pages of annexes, legislation, and methodology. And then by digitaliz digitalization of that process, you also are able to greatly improve on the timely uh, availability of audited report and basically and, uh, make certain that the data that is created is of the highest quality in a timely manner. And then disseminating those data towards financial institution so that they can A, create, the, be reg regulatory compliant basically, but secondly and more importantly, so that they can really assess and, and uncover truly sustainable uh, opportunities. Now to help corporates, because they are at the, the heart of that, that system, uh, we, the, the, the idea is to reduce data redundancy. Uh, there is thousands of ESG framework, thousands of ESG legislation, and some of those data points are the same. There is a mapping to be done. And so you could, you could gather any publicly available data that is already usable for taxonomy screening, as well as gather any private internal data that is already there but just need to be included in the taxonomy screening to speed up the process. And for the data that corporates are not yet calculating, there are thousands of third-party providers, service providers that are more than able to help compute the last step of the taxonomy screening and achieve their uh, report. And, sorry. Once you have done so, once you basically streamline the com compliance part of the taxonomy, you give more time to corporate to actually use the taxonomy as a transition tool. The goal for each corporate should not be to simply be compliant with a new legislation, but to use the, le the legislation as it was intended to, to transition towards a more sustainable state. By identifying the materiality, thanks to a methodology that is now common to the entire market, to set its strategy and to monitor the impact of that strategy, and finally, to report on the benefits of their strategy and disclose their yearly report. And I think this is really the goal of that legislation. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> big, big, big thanks for that. It was a very good explanation, I think. I understand a lot better than I used to before you came on stage, so thanks for that. Um, our next panelist, I will invite you all on stage. Um, we have one panelist who did not make it uh, to the room, that's David Dab, but he is, of course, being the Microsoft uh, National Technology Officer, which is in a digital format, so I hope that we can also uh, screen and beam uh, David Dab up here into the room. Uh, the other panelists, I invite you to take a seat, um, and I would uh, like to ask Solana's moderator to do the introductions of, of everybody course. and um, move it there. So, uh, David, we can see you, and if you make, oui, uh, can you say something so we're sure that the sound comes back too? Let's have a test. 
Don't know if you right. can hear me. Yes. Hello, everyone. Now we hear you loud and clear. So everything here is uh, working well, and uh, looking forward to this uh, panel as well. So go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Solène uh, Very happy to be here today uh, with our five uh, panelists um, to discuss about regulation. So it's again regulation, but it's going to be very practical, and we have a lot of uh, uh, information from the different guests uh, about the way they practice um, regulation day to day. So I will introduce uh, our five guests. We have uh, Nadia uh, Manzari. Thank you for coming, uh, Nadia, from Luxembourg. Your attorney and partner at Schiltz and Schiltz, which is a law firm based in Luxembourg and specialized in financial services and fintech. And we have the chance to have you today because you have been working 17 years at the CSSF, so the Luxembourgish uh, regulator, and uh, you have a lot of crispy anecdotes to tell us today. <laughs> uh, and um, you have uh, contributed a lot to uh, the development uh, of the uh, fintech ecosystem in Luxembourg. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Solène. Uh, then we have uh, Eric Lassus. Uh, Eric is uh, from Bordeaux. I just uh, realized this today. And he's the co-founder and the CEO of uh, the international banking as a service platform, Trezor, which has been acquired by Groupe Société Générale in 2019. And you have an extensive uh, experience also in the financial sector and in ICT since you've been uh, working for IBM and Euroclear. Um, then, uh, joining by Visio Conference, we have Dav uh, David Dab, who is a National Technology Officer at Microsoft Belux. Hello, David. Hello. And David, you've held several senior positions as consultant at McKinsey and a position of CIO at ING Belgium. Thank you for coming. Um, then uh, we have Agnieszka Bruyère. Good afternoon, Agnieszka. You've done your uh, entire career at IBM uh, for, um, and held several, several senior positions, and currently you're Vice President Hybrid Cloud EMEA. And then uh, last but not least, we have Wouter van der Boesche. Do I pronounce correctly your name? <laughs> <laughs> your Solution Lead Security and Service Intelligence at Proximus. And you have a, a strong technical background since you've been working at Philips and Verizon. Uh, on areas such as identity and access management. So thank you very much to uh, you five uh, for, for that uh, time uh, with us and for joining this uh, Digital Finance Summit. So we will talk about regulation. Regulation is inherent in the financial uh, uh, ecosystem and the financial sectors. And sometimes we realize that regulators and innovators have uh, different timing and challenges. And this is, uh, we will try to understand um, the way we can navigate regulation on one side and regulators on the other side through your different uh, professional experiences. So Nadia, maybe we can start with you, uh, considering that you have a very rich experience as a attorney and also uh, within the CSSF. Can you please tell us this afternoon how you support your clients navigate the regulators, but very concretely, please. Navigate, it might be the right word, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really depends on, um, on, on what level they, they ask me for the advice. So uh, uh, there are different levels at the regulator where you have to have a, a lot of exchange with them to get, engage in discussions with the regulator. And the first level, of course, is the licensing and the authorization process. And they are usually, what the, the challenges for the firm is that they, they, they are developing a business, they have a great idea, they have a business model, they have a tool to do payments, or to, uh, they have specific new investment uh, products. And the challenge is very often to find a way or to, to join the technological requirements and the legal requirements. So at that, and I think that's for me the, the, my preferred intervention at, uh, or my preferred exchange with, with uh, customers because it's very interesting. We, we, we are working together on the development. And, and my input usually is that um, when, when they, 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 they show me their business model, when we are developing the step-by-step -step description, very often I say, yeah, but if you take this way, if you just do the technological setup in that way, we get, we will have an, an it will have an impact on, on the regulation. It will not be able to implement it. But if we take it from the other way around, if you, sometimes it's, and that's my experience now over, and that it was exactly the same at the regulator, and I, I had the same approach towards regulation at regulator, I very often realized that it really depends on how do you, you organize your setup on both sides, on, on the technological side and on the legal side, and, that, and 
depending on how you organize it, how you develop it, how you restructure, oh, very often it's just a restructuring a little bit your product and you fit into the regulation and it's even very often the way you restructure it or you structure it, you, you, a less complex regulation might apply to you. And that's a very, I would say, the very important step when you go to the regulator to be ready to understand what impact your product has with regard to the law and vice versa. So that's really, I would say, uh, um, uh, the first step and, 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 and how I usually explain them that, that sometimes at, at the beginning, at the regulator, I was told it's not possible. Technology is not going to allow us to do that. The law is not going to allow, uh, no, it was, uh, it's not possible. The law is blocking us. I said, normally there's no blocking point. It's normally we find a solution. It's just the, the, the way you do the setup. So that's, I would say, the first takeaway I, I had over my, my 20 years of experience as, as a regulator or at the regulator. Uh, the other step is that I always tell them, regulation is also the skeleton, it's the governance. If you have a good governance and a good skeleton, usually you, you can uh, inspect a long-term performance and, and, and you can inspect bringing your product somewhere where it's profitable for you. So that's on the first step. When they ask me for their advice on a, in the ongoing business, so we have different levels. We have the levels where they had had an on-site inspection of the regulator and they are asked to redress. Very often they are very scared at the beginning and say, oh no, my business is down, it, it's not gonna work. But here again, it's very often how you lay out the things, how you put, the, how, how you put things on paper, or how your policies are set up. So and there again, it's, it's a specific language you have to use with, with the regulator. It's also a specific way to join, again, regulation and technology. So that's, here again, it's the same thing. In mergers, in, in M&A, of course, we have different ways to engage with the regulator. Um, and and uh, for license extensions, the process is also all usually the same. I would say the biggest takeaway for my, my or the biggest, yeah, the, the advice I usually give to my firm is be transparent engage early at early stages because otherwise you might be surprised that yeah then sometimes it happens you're not the way you are setting up your business it's not going to work but if you engage early usually the, you also find solutions so um, yeah transparency involvement and engagement with the regulator take them on the early stage go to go and see them ask the questions and yeah i would say that's the first uh, that's how I, yeah. I work with them now, and I've, yeah, I worked also before, I think. I have Considering that uh, in the audience we have people coming from, I mean, different countries in Europe, yeah. how would you define, now you're no longer working for CSSF, how would you define the Luxembourg regulator? Is it a pragmatic one, or I rigid? I just can take for my 17 years of experience as a regulator, I just can tell you, I came from the university, I ended up, I did my law firm, law school, sorry, uh, first year, my first exam, and then I, I decided to go to the CSSF for three years. First thing I had to deal with was the payment services directive. I loved it. Many people didn't like it because it was something very weird, apparently, very, a lot of impact already uh, from a technological point of view. And um, I also I planned to be there for three years, and I ended up being there 17 years, and I, I, I really loved my, my, my work there. I, it's, I, I'm not no, a big fan of regulation, but just the, the exchange I had, the possibility to set up the, the, the ecosystem in Luxembourg, to implement PSD1, to see the actors, to meet big actors, um, and, and, and also to see this process. At the beginning, it was quite weird, because even I, I would say, I was a regulator, I, I am, <laughs> I was a regulator at that time too. And um, the challenge for me was when I was trying to explain, in my word, SRAP, capital requirements, ICAP, they all, people look at me, and when they talk to me with, from their development, their, their technology, the tools, the, the, the application, the codes, I, we, I think for six months to a year, I really had, I, it took me six months to a year to realize we have an understanding problem. We have to explain what we are doing, and we have to ask them to explain us what they are doing. That's how we, I, I, I manage with my team, we manage to work together, and, and, and we, we, yeah, and, and we, we were able to find solutions. I just take, uh, 
because usually the products uh, are not fitting in one regulation at the beginning. So sometimes you, for uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, for example, in 2014, we decided to regulate them, but we, we also had to do work. Where can we, what, what are they providing? Are they providing a financial service? Because otherwise you cannot regulate them. We found that they were providing a financial service and so we took a first step to regulate them. So it's really the way we processed. So I would say that, uh, yeah, we did, great things, and yesterday the, the regulator again issued a paper yeah. confirming that financial firms, institutionals can go into crypto. So there is a process, and I think this process has been launched many years ago uh, to try to engage with the industry to listen, because this was a request from the industry also asking, just give us a hint, give us an idea, give us something to be comfortable with that we can go into the sector. And he's still doing it, so. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. It's a very great transition uh, to you, Eric, because uh, when you launched a Treasor, banking as a service was not very, I mean, developed uh, in the fintech ecosystem. I don't even know if we're talking about fintech. Uh, so can you please get back uh, in the past and tell us a bit about your relationship uh, with the French Supervision Authority and how that happened, uh, how the, the relationship you, you built with the, the ACPR uh, evolved, and how were you able to bring that level of comfort uh, to the ACPR, especially regarding your agents, because you have a lot of agents. Yeah, so the, it was funny because the, the genesis of our relationship with the French regulator was a little bit, I would say, hard or harsh, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yes, I've started Perhaps one of the first fintech in France, as you said, the, 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 the word fintech didn't exist at that time. It was around 2006. And uh, we grew and uh, we, we, uh, we grew at, and we reached a level where we, we understood that uh, we will have to cope with uh, regulation things, technical scaling, etc. And uh, the, the discussion we start with the regulation uh, was just after receive a letter saying, okay, you are making a business that should be regulated. So it is an invitation to go to jail and to pay 100, 350,000 euro uh, uh, if we do not react quickly, etc., etc. So it was quite funny uh, because at that time we have decided to stop the business and to, to create treasure as we have understood that we as B licensed is costly for, for, for some company. So to avoid that and to allow company to, to go to the market uh, without carrying the regulation things too much, it's to, to create a, a bank as a service platform. This is a term that is very well known today, but uh, six years uh, later, um, it was not the case. And we have the ideas to create this, uh, this company uh, to uh, allow other fintech as us to be connected uh, and to uh, benefit our license and our uh, API. So we went to the regulator and so it was not simple at the beginning and also at the same time in France, uh, we uh, 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 payment institution uh, came to bankrupt, same time. Same time. So, the regulator was a little bit nervous. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, that guys are funny. Okay, fantastic. So we, try, we, we start, the, we start the, 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 the program, as you said, but uh, they, they did realize that we were, I would say, professional uh, as well. So uh, we start the, 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 to, to apply for a payment institution and e-money uh, uh, issuer. And it lasts one year and eight months. So we, it was a very long journey for us, uh, but it was the very beginning. And we, we uh, unfortunately, we were very, I would say, the regulator were, was not comfortable with us because we talk about the cloud. <laughs> We talk, etc. So we have everything that makes them nervous on the table. So uh, it couldn't be Red flags more everywhere. complex. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we did it. <laughs> but allez, after discussing, and the point you, you raised, Nadia, is very important. Never be afraid to talk with the regulator. 
So this, maybe this is the mistake we did, because, but we start with a big letter also, so <laughs> I think it was not really a, a good idea f to, for them to approach us, but at the end of the day, we understood that the, 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 the more you communicate with the regulator, the best it is. So we can make things evolve, the trust uh, to, uh, to be created between uh, the, the actors. So I think it's, it's mandatory. And uh, what we have done, it's we, we do not talk about everything. Because as soon as you talk to everything to a regulator, it is a year more, you know. <laughs> to be regulated. So you, you, the, the, we say the minimum of the minimum of the minimum, and that's it. And so we do not, never talk about the agent things, because voila, it will be uh, crazy. So we, we regulated treasure, and we start after to present an agent file to regulate our client. And they say, ah, you have put in the market a new thing. It's very interesting. So fantastic. Eight months later, we will have our first agent. So today, we are able to regulate an agent in three, four months because we, as we discussed with the regulator, we build a template where uh, enfin, it, it, it is very well structured. So we, we put every information they need to, uh, uh, to have and to, uh, so they, they are able to check everything, uh, technical, security, uh, uh, skills, uh, finance, etc and uh, how we proceed with the lab FT, AML, etc. everything that uh, interests the regulator. So now we, are, we have built uh, a, a very high trust with, with them. So they decided to audit treasure. So they come with eight people during eight months, I tell you. 1,000 documents provided, 3,000 <laughs> 3, questions more uh, added, uh, something crazy. But anyway, uh, this has been said, uh, okay, we, we, we have now 100 clients connected to Treasure. That means that if Treasure failed, we may have a kind of systemic things with the FinTech. So it is very serious at the end of the day. So even though we, we joke a little bit with the regulator, but they, they, have, uh, they, 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 are, they are there to protect the final client. So we, we need to take it as a very serious matter. It's very important. So the more we communicate, the better it will be. And next year, we have 100 agents at Treasure. And next year, we are about to set 1,000 more. So uh, we are anticipating this move, because it will be a very smart move for them, <laughs> multiplied by, by 10 uh, the, the work. Uh, and we, what we want to avoid, it, what we have seen uh, in France, but it has disappeared. So now it's, it is very better, but it is more, much more better. But w what we have seen, it's, we have two, the, the regulators have a SLA to respect. For example, if you provide a file, they have two months to answer you additional questions or saying yes or no, or perhaps, I don't know. Uh, sometimes the last day the last week, the last day, the last hour for the Friday at 5 p.m., we receive uh, a mail from the regulator with 50 additional questions. So they need time, actually. <laughs> and interesting to say that for several agents, it was the same questions. So it was unfair. To be, to be honest. But allez, things has evolved and now we are, we are on the move and uh, really, um, because we, we, we discussed a lot, I express, uh, we, we were not, I would say, uh, happy with that because for us, it's a business issue because if our agents are not certified, we cannot make business. So it, it put us on the tunnel where you have the cost but you have not the revenue. So it, 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 it it, play, uh, fin, it could play a, a huge uh, role on, on accelerating things. Otherwise, even the, the agent and the clients may die before they go to the market because of that. So, uh, but today, uh, I think in France, we are, we are on the right way and it is very, very, very sim fin, uh, more simple. So we decided to go to Germany. Also, the, the year, there is a famous bankrupt as well, so we will see uh, what will happen with the German regulator.
Thank you very much. Uh, Aneska, um, you, you said when we prepared this panel that you were involved in several uh, European regulatory projects. Could you take a, mom a mom moment with us, sorry, to explain uh, with the example of DORA, with, which is the Digital Operational Resilience Act for Financial Services, what is the intention of uh, the Commission with the DORA? And a little bit of experience around this. So, um, DORA, it's a as I used, it's a really a big shift. It's really a, a change in terms of approaching uh, regulation in financial sector, uh, because until now, so all the banks and financial institutions have the EBA directives, right? So you know that you need to make sure of the cyber, uh, cyber security risk, you need, you need to make sure that you do not have dependency of the cloud provider or any provider, that you need to have the reversibility, the disaster recovery measures. I mean, so you have a, a number of, let's say, general um, directives how to make the uh, financial business sustainable looking also from technology perspective. DORA is completely different because DORA is actually translating all these high-level requirements into specific security controls and measures that you need to implement. So this is, and I will tell you what, why, why, why it's important, but what's even more important that the, the technology provider, the cloud provider, needs to comply with these measures. So it's a kind of uh, bringing the accountability for the right settings in terms of security and compliance, including GDPR, to the cloud providers, rather than just having a bank professionals, sometimes it's challenging to make sure that the right security and compliance measures are in place. And why, I will tell you why it's important, because we can say, well, another regulation, it will be a huge burden, how we will cope with this. So our experience, so we set up two years ago FS framework for our cloud, so the intention was to establish a common baseline about all the security controls we need to implement in the cloud to feel comfortable about the regulation in US, but also in Europe and in UK. And we've got, uh, we set up the um, Financial Services Council, so we gather a number of banks. Today we have 100 banks, and we, can, we could see that even if, let's say, 50, 60% of the controls were the, a kind of the same, but setting this common baseline was actually a challenging work, right? It's still ongoing. So what Dora will bring, it's a kind of this setting this baseline, and it will be very interesting because every financial institution, every fintech, and every technology provider will have this clear baseline about the security measures that needs to be implemented. So I think it will be a great benefit. Uh, in terms of measures uh, as such, nothing new, guys, I would say. Uh, everything is based on NIST, on ISO, and any frameworks we already know. Um, so, um, when we assess our FS framework against current DORA status, we see that there is kind of 90% overlap. And then there is some other question like concentration risk, etc., which are not security measures, but rather systemic risk that um, a financial institution can, can cope with. So, so this, is, um, this is something that I think that will be, will be very useful actually for the financial sector, fintechs included. Um, another aspect, what's interesting, what we put in place, it's automation of the deployment of these measures and providing the evidence that the, these measures are in place. Because you talk about this huge task of producing the documents for the regulators. So the automation will help uh, and uh, of measuring of the security controls will help to remove this burden of producing evidence because you have implementation and then you need to produce the evidence. So this automation that we put in place has the objective to remove this burden and also to onboard very quickly fintechs on uh, potentially on our clouds, having this established baseline in terms of cloud infrastructure to make them feel comfortable and to be able to sell to the, to the big banks. And I think that um, we are talking a lot about um, fintech, and we've got Greenham, right, just before our panel. Uh, so I think that the technology as such can also serve uh, 
to make you much more efficient from the regulation perspective, because you can use the technology to automate things and to make it much more uh, efficient, fast. Maybe it won't be one year and eight months, but maybe less, right? So there are also the benefits. And then, as you said, Nadia, uh, when we are talking with regulators, we are talking about the regulators. We need to think that what's the purpose, right? What's the end? It's not the measures, uh, it's not the Article 22 something, right? It's the purpose of the regulation, and we need to realize it does make sense, this regulation, right? To protect clients, to protect citizens, to protect companies against bankruptcy, etc., and having systemic risks in the system. So uh, anytime we are having the conversation with regulators, it's always good to talk about this final goal while bringing some operational challenges that we might have if any specific measures are not so much easy to deploy with the technology providers or with our clients in financial sector and fintechs. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, may I ask David to join? I don't know if we can see him. I'm, I'm here. This. Yes, hi, David. Um, Hello. Did you have the chance to hear what we already said? I mean, you were uh, connected. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, absolutely. I hope you can hear me as well, but it's very clear on my side. Perfect. So you, you have a, a huge experience uh, at McKinsey, as, as we said, and, and uh, ING too. And so you know perfectly how technology can serve Uh, the financial sector and uh, what we can face sometimes is regulator on one side, incumbent players and new players don't have the same perception of, of technology and don't necessarily see the advantage uh, of it uh, in all situations. Um, how do you think technology disruption can better serve uh, the financial sectors? I mean, uh, this is a very in interesting uh, question. Uh, thanks a lot. No, maybe let's... Let me step back for a second, right, and, and think about technology in general for a bank, let's say a bank, like an incumbent bank, right? And, and when one talks about technology for a bank, very often one focuses on uh, digital services, digital products, uh, digital channels. There is, there is an echo on my side, I don't know if it's on your side. Um, and. Um, You know, there is less attention on actually uh, what's under the hood. Sometimes one speaks about blockchain, uh, uh, bot technology, but actually, if you are a bank, if you really want to become a digital player, it's and, and comply, right? Because that's very important too. It's all about producing code, producing software that will deliver a client benefit and that will comply, right? And, and that's a very important question. Uh, but usually we want to speak less about that one. And, and, you know, if you want to be serious about producing code in an effective manner, and if you want to comply, I mean, the, the place, the only place where uh, you can do that seriously and truly become a, a technology player that is producing code uh, at the end of the day, it's the cloud, right? And, and the reason is that modern uh, DevOps happens in the cloud. That's why you produce in the cloud, big data happens in the cloud. And innovation in general, there's such an amount of innovation that is delivered through the cloud. I mean, things like confidential compute, for instance, confidential computing, which is a new technology which allows to keep data encrypted all the time, not just at rest, not just in transit, but when data is used. And it's by, by design, you get full encryption, full, full protection of data. All of that happens in the cloud. So maybe my, my first point is, You know, uh, cloud is the place to be, it's the only place to be if you, you want uh, to seriously play the game. And that brings me back to compliance, right? You know, I just mentioned a technology uh, which brings confidentiality and data protection by design. Um, you know, there, there is a big shift uh, in my view that is taking place that in the past until now, but that's less the case, the perspective of regulator, wow, I have a new technology and we, we heard about Trezor, Uh, a few minutes ago, and they say, wow, this is dangerous. I need to control these things, right? I need to make sure that it doesn't harm, it doesn't create things I don't want. And more and more, uh, we're going to see a shift where um, regulators, authorities will see technology uh, less as something they have to control. Of course, they have to control it, but more and more as something that can enable them to achieve their objectives, right? That can help them achieve, uh, you know, important things in their eyes and in the eyes of society at large. And here, you know, one has to step back a little bit and 
the kind of old paradigm of um, regulation and audit and say it's real. Well, I have an objective, and I need to translate then this objective in conditions. What are the conditions that will make sure that that objective is is achieved, right? And then from from the conditions, you set a number of controls, and then you put the controls in place, and then how it is going to come once in a while and check that the controls are there and they're in place. Now, the problem with this is that you haven't controlled the bottom. Control that, well, the controls are in place. But, you know, how far are you sure that it brings the, uh, the result, the outcome that you want? And basically, thanks to technology, you know, it's possible to ensure, um, you know, that the outcome is there, uh, that by design, there is no other way than to have the outcome at the end. Uh, there is no other way to basically comply. Compliance by design all the time. And let me give you an example. Like if you think about cybersecurity, you know, obviously people are concerned about vulnerabilities, and then you have like controls like uh, making a pen test once in a while, or maybe uh, assessing if you have vulnerabilities. But you know, if you have vulnerabilities, it doesn't show that you've left something on the side, that there is no ilche uh, attack to something important. No, the technology exists that can run 10 tests every day, 24 by 7, and not look for vulnerabilities. It looks for entire attack path to things that are important. And, and this is another example. I mentioned, you know, um, confidential compute. There are many, many things which guarantees an outcome. So that's going to be a big, big change uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulation and technology. Uh, and they will go more and more together, in my view. Thank you very much. I, may I ask you an additional question because uh, you're currently working at uh, Microsoft. What would be your, your best advice vis-a-vis -vis the regulator uh, when a bank, for instance, want to outsource uh, uh, its cloud to Azure uh, or when, when a FinTech is launching a, a new product in the cloud? What are the, 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 I mean, the, the must do's vis-a-vis uh, -vis regulator? Look, quite frankly, the, the cloud is, is uh, very much accepted. There are a lot of banks uh, that are on the cloud. It, the technology is well known to regulators. Uh, it, it's kind of already, I wouldn't say the past, it's not the past, but you know, from a regulatory point of view, uh, everybody is comfortable with it. It doesn't mean that you don't have to go through process, that you don't have to answer certain questions. But you know, what Trezor had to uh, go through, and we heard about that uh, uh, earlier, you know, that's over. I mean, I mean, it's accepted and actually it's recognized, it's more than accepted, it's recognized that uh, in terms of uh, data availability, data integrity, uh, security, protection against like cyber attacks and so on, but also from a pure compliance point of view, I mean, the best place to go is a modern hyperscale cloud. That's accepted, right? And people understand that. I think if I take your question more broadly, and it was already said several times today, and actually, it goes both sides. It's not just how regulators need to look at new technology and maybe fintechs and technology players, but the opposite. I think the, the answer is very simple, actually. You know, it's a lot about talking, talking early on, and actually more than talking, it's listening, right, on both sides. Listen and try to understand the perspective of the other party. Actually, both parties come with very good intentions. Uh, they have important objectives to achieve, right? The, 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 the fintech, the startup wants to solve a problem. They want to bring a new solution to a painful problem. Uh, that's a very legitimate objective. And the regulator has also objectives in terms of maintaining uh, the stability of the financial system, for instance, uh, maintaining trust in the financial system. That's very legitimate as well. But these two worlds usually don't understand each other, don't speak the same language, and therefore dialogue is key. Right, uh, and try to learn, uh, try to understand the other party, uh, where they come from, uh, be in a problem-solving mindset to find a solution to uh, the problem of the other party. And if you do that early on, and if you build trust, you know it's going to go uh, very well because there are plenty of solutions uh, to uh, to solve problems, and technology can help. Right? You know, uh, technology can solve many different things. 
Thank you very much. Good news because we have people representing Belgium, Luxembourg, <laughs> France. So it, it's great to see that the regulator now has evolved a lot. Uh, last, years. Um, last intervention, voter. Um, so we, we talk about trust, trust in the system, um, trust in the security. And um, this is something that you do day to day with your clients. Um, how do you bring uh, to your clients and how do you help your clients and concretely support your clients and particularly uh, towards the regulator uh, to bring that level of comfort from a pure IT security perspective, concretely? Thank you. Um, yeah, you mentioned the key word. Uh, we, we heard it a couple of times already the past hour. It's, it's a trust word. Uh, we, we heard it starting uh, with the uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mathieu Michel. Uh, trust was key, I think trust is key in, in the financial industry and, and, and there's always been a strong, let's say, orchestration of trust with, with regulations, with, with this different type of, of um, uh, programs put in place. Um, uh, similar cases is fell out in cybersecurity. Yeah? We have uh, specific cybersecurity policies in place. Uh, we have, for example, if you work with SWIFT, you have the customer uh, support program, CSP, we have within uh, Basel III of cybersecurity regulation. We heard um, from Agnieszka the different uh, components in there. We have an ISO certifications there. So um, trust is typically orchestrated, but what we've seen in, in, in the past years is that trust is becoming much more kind of diluted sometimes. Uh, uh, trust is, 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 is being um, uh, being, being put in place not only by regulators but also with peer-to-peer with -peer interactions with other organizations. I think within the financial industry, we've seen the PSD2 um, kind of inflow of, of new digital interactions um, with, with, with different companies. And, and um, in, in that, that sense, the, the, the trust is something that, that has to be kind of earned and, 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 and built out. Um, Uh, look, looking at, at, at trust within cybersecurity, then the, um, the 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 key question that's that's being added on top of the the past question on trust is how can we validate trust? How can we validate trust not only at design time? Because typically regulation looks at the design of an organization, design of a process. How can we validate trust at transaction time? And um, uh, within cybersecurity. This really ties into the new um, paradigm shift in, of the architecture towards zero trust architecture. And, and, and in that, that type of approach, trust is something that you don't assume that's there. It's something that you verify at transaction time. You verify the entire context of the transaction, verify that the person that is doing the transaction, the, the application that's involved, plays the, the, the location, also the time, and, and all the, the circumstances of the transactions are uh, in line with the trust framework and um, verifying that trust at transaction time is actually the new paradigm shift within cybersecurity and it's, it's, it's certainly happening within, within the financial world. Um, um, uh, these, these, um, um, the, uh, the, the other point I, I want to make um, is, is not necessarily related to trust, but uh, it's related to the different, say, cybersecurity outcomes that uh, organizations are striving for. In the past, cybersecurity was really looked at from a kind of um, thought perspective, fear, certainty, and doubt, and looking at cybersecurity, trying to just prevent threats and making sure that threats are not, not uh, incurred by a company. But now we see clearly a shift and, and we define kind of the five business outcomes uh, companies and uh, certainly financial institutions are looking for when they, they talk about cybersecurity. And threat prevention certainly is, is one of them. Uh, looking at, at, at financial institutions, we also see uh, data protection and information protection as one of the, the key business outcomes why uh, organizations invest in cybersecurity. And uh, I think we all know that, that, that the trust has to be there and, and it's clearly tied into, into, into protecting information of your customers. Um, uh, the, the third business outcome next to threat prevention and, and visibility that, that we see our customers really striving for uh, is, is visibility. Uh, being able to view, uh, have a view of, of your digital estate, getting your digital assets uh, up to the, the, the state. Uh, David mentioned uh, the vulnerability aspect, at understanding where you're vulnerable and how th that vulnerability could interact with uh, 
with your company. And a fourth outcome, and that's I think the most obvious one within this context, is a compliance uh, enforcement one. A lot of companies just invest in cybersecurity because they have to, because they have to write a report, because they, they have this audit report with, with some red flags on it. Um, but we've seen clearly a shift where compliance is not just a report. Compliance is being put into the process of, of, of security. It's, it's in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, the compliance aspects are, are put, in, put in there. Uh, the, the reporting is not just done on a, on a weekly, or monthly, or quarterly, or best case, yearly basis. No, it's, it's, it's being embedded into the operational process of, of uh, uh, security operation centers, for example, where you can in real time almost monitor your compliance to, to regulations. And, and then the fifth business outcome why, why we see companies really investing in cyber security, and that's becoming, uh, has become very prevalent last, last year, is, is cyber resilience. Uh, companies just want to be more resilient against cyber attacks. Uh, we've seen the, cyber, the resilience against kind of financial um, events uh, being very dominant in regulations the last years, but now you see the, the res being resilient against the cyber security attacks as one of the, the main drivers for, for investments now in cyber security. And, and I mean, obviously it's been driven by, by um, um, by many incidents where, where the impact was very severe uh, and, and uh, where especially the inability to react, the inability to, to, to recover from such an attack has, has really um, had the very bad effects on, on organizations. So, so the, these five outcomes, uh, looking at threat prevention as, as a, the most known one, information protection, vulnerability, uh, visibility, and, um, and, and resilience are, are the five main reasons why, why we see investments in cybersecurity in, in, in this domain. Thank you very much. We have some time left, uh, a few minutes left. Few minutes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so one last question to all of you, uh, so if you want to, to, to answer is, uh, we want in Europe to have our champions, our European champions. How could we, uh, at European level, improve the relationship between the innovators on one side and the lawmakers to shape a, a EU reg regulation that really facilitates the, the birth of, of these European champions. Do you have some, I mean, ideas to share with us? I can comment. Uh, go on. Yeah, uh, just one word. So I think it's time now to uh, standardize the KYC things and the uh, AML things. Please, <laughs> at Treasure, <laughs> we have tens of provider for each country because uh, each country is not happy with the other one. So. Are we in Europe or not? So <laughs> things are so different between France and Germany or Italy. Please, can we standardize this and, and, and move forward? That process is running already. So the AML package has been published and it's normally the, the objective is to standardize that. But um, I would say smart regulation uh, is, is the answer to have a competitive uh, EU fintech or banking, financial sector, I would say. It's really smart regulation. We always talk about proportionality. It's exactly that. Proportionate measures for businesses. Um, but on the other side, I, think I find it still, every regulation gives open so many opportunities. So it's just really, afterwards, we, we have to, to, to keep in mind that we have to apply it in, in, a, in a smart way. But the opportunities, just look at PSD1, PSD2, how the sector exploded, everything exploded. When I look at the new regulation we have now on crowdfunding and all the business opportunities we have in it, it's not always a barrier, it's not always a hurdle, it's a challenge, it's always a challenge. But you have so many opportunities in there, so that's what I wanted to come. Absolutely, and from technology perspective, it's ongoing as well, right? But of, we are not there yet. But potentially, I mean, Dora is coming in 2022. Um, my expectation when I'm talking to the regulators in France, they are looking for this because at least they will have the cl cl clarity and the fact to have this detailed as it will be, it will be much easier to adapt on, in every single country. So technology-wise, it's ongoing, we can expect in 2022 it will be fixed. Then the, the other question, which is collaboration and all the Europeans' uh, um, sovereignty and initiatives, I truly believe in an open ecosystem and collaboration. Everybody needs to bring um, his own value proposition all together. The question is, what are the platform to create this collaboration, right? So we have this Gaia X initiative that is not moving maybe fast enough in terms of creating the true business value and impact. 
but I do hope that because at least this exists, a kind of platform for collaboration between different actors that maybe it will have some impacts also in terms of creating new ecosystem and driving business results for European economy and digital sovereignty. Thank you. Do you want to say a few yeah, words? Uh, yeah, one, of, one of the topics we've seen it a couple of times already is, is, the, is the collaboration on, on data level. How are we going to collaborate more openly and more trustworthy with each other on, on data level? And I, in that perspective, I really value initiatives like, like data pods, uh, where we, we find new ways to kind of decentralize control over data. And, and these domains are really kind of uh, at the, at the, at the uh, the combination of, of regulation with industry and, and government actors trying to figure out how we can protect our privacy while still uh, keeping that, that, that value of, of sharing data and, and, and even opening more of the financial data up to, to, to each other. Uh, Thank you. And, and does David still uh, connect? Is, is he still connected? Uh, uh, yes, you want to say a few words? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't have the answer to the question, but maybe a reflection, right? Uh, I think it would be terrific if there would be a way for uh, the regulation and the law to adopt a more iterative, a more agile approach to regulation, right? The, the, the time frame on which innovation happens, the uh, very iterative nature of innovation when people pivot and explore fast new territories is a very different timing um, from regulation, right? And I think if there would be a way to introduce some level of, maybe through some time the boxing, I don't know, uh, also experimentation, where you experiment the law, where you experiment the regulation and you see if it achieves its objectives and if not, you adjust, would be would be great. But of course, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I have no background in lawmaking. So uh, maybe it's more just a, a dream here. Uh, but that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we can applaud uh, our panelists. And thank you uh, very much for your interesting insights and, and for sharing your uh, very rich experience.